Okay. All right. That's an interesting start to the show. Mono Sambonani, hello, how's it? Good evening, good people. Welcome to Liberty and Friends, your week ending, or well, it should be on Sundays usually, but your week ending news analysis and opinion show. My name is Sikhle Ngobese, a.k.a. Big Daddy Liberty. Um, apologies for that little glitch in the beginning. My phone just uh, went on uh, sleep mode. Very nice. Uh, uh, welcome to it, good people. Uh, this is the one long format show that I have on the BDL show. So we're going to spend the next 90 minutes unpacking and really providing news analysis and opinion that you won't get anywhere else. Um, about the news week that was last week. With that being said, remember, remember, hit that like button, please, um, as the numbers start trickling up very nicely and slowly. Hit that like button. It really does help get the stream out. And if you can, share the stream. Share it on Twitter, YouTube, or Facebook, depending on where you're watching this. Please share and let people know that uh, the Liberty and Friends show is happening right now and not on its usual time slot of Sunday. On Liberty and Friends, as usual, we have a panel uh, of thinkers, guys who helped me break down the news week that was by providing that analysis and opinion. And with that being said, let me actually bring them on because they're going to help us unpack quite a few issues tonight. It is quite a bumper and jam-packed show. I want to bring on some very familiar faces here. He is one-third of the Man Patriot team, a co-host of that particular show. I'm talking, of course, about Ukoketo Orisane. There he is on screen. Ukoketo, good evening. Yeah, good evening, Seatler. Good evening to everyone watching. It's blazing hot, at least where I am, but that doesn't mean we don't have coffee. It's never too hot for coffee. There, I said it. Amen to that. Uh, that's Ukoketo Orisane, of course, from the Man Patriot. Podcast. Make sure you check them out on Facebook and give them a like and a follow, please. And uh, watch some of their content. In fact, their host, Dumont, was on the Ronaldo Host show last night. Hope you guys caught that. Welcome to it, Coqueto. Another face who is familiar and also one uh, a co host of a particular show. This is the Two Crickets in a Thorn Tree podcast. Make sure you find them, please, on YouTube and give them a follow. I'm talking, of course, about Oprah, Gabriel Krauser. There he is. Good evening, Gabriel. Welcome to Liberty and Friends. How's it, Sitler? How's it, Koketsa? How's it to the viewers? Very, very good to be here. On a Monday, what a way to start the week, man. Tell me about it, dude. It always feels weird when I am unable to do the show on a Sunday and I do it on a Monday. But good to have you on with us. A, another chap who, again, not a stranger to anybody who watches the BDL show. He is one of the more prominent uh, analysts and voices, analyst voices, pardon me, out of the Free Market Foundation. Does do a lot of work also with other organizations such as Sarkelia. I'm talking, of course, about our resident legal eagle and really someone I look to on all things libertarianism. Um, oh, Martin van Staden. There he is. Martin, good evening. Welcome to LNA. Howdy. Thank you for having me. Brother, good to have you on. And um, speaking about someone who we all enjoy having on here, I've seen also comments uh, asking where she's been. Well, here she is. I'm talking, of course, about the editor-in-chief of The Daily Friend, Umam Sara Gunn. There she is. Sara, good evening. Good evening, Sekla. Thanks very much, and thanks for the uh, nice intro. Um, my, da- my week has started on very good terms. Yeah, that's what to say. That's how we roll again, BDL show. Uh, um, last but definitely not least, a chap who, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I may have been on his show, or he's been on mine, I can't really remember, but nonetheless, you'll help me remember Upegi Makhobu, who's an analyst at the Center for Risk Analysis. Peggy, good evening. Welcome to LMF. Good evening, Sisha. I wish I had you on my show. I was actually on your show. But good evening ah, to you. you <laughs> Glad to be here. <laughs> That's right. That was the episode last month with Mike Schussler, um, Schussler if I'm yes. not mistaken. Absolutely. You guys can find that, of course, on the Big Daddy Liberty channel. Make sure you head over to the BDL channel on Facebook and Twitter and, of course, on YouTube. On YouTube, I would really appreciate it if you hit that like or rather that subscribe Um 
button and make sure you hit the bell notification so that you're notified every time there is a show. And please do hit that bell because um, it's almost meaningless these days to so just be a subscriber. YouTube is being funny as usual. With that being said, with the house is packed, um, fellas and ladies, let's get straight into it perhaps because it has been a rather bumper news week last week. Now, ordinarily we don't begin... Uh, the show, or we don't do the show on a Monday because, you know, we've covered the previous week, but I wanted to actually do something a little different and begin uh, with news that actually came out today. Um, but we'll be brief on this one, but it does warrant a little bit of attention. Um, and that is, it's actually kind of gone a little bit quietly unannounced, uh, or not unannounced, but it's gone quietly unnoticed, rather. And that is Nkosa Zanai Gamini Zuma, a.k.a. Buffalo Bill on this channel because she keeps us in the hole and wonders and asks us to put the lotion on our skin. Uh, um, <laughs> announcing, again, the extension of this asinine state of disaster, which, of course, facilitates uh, what has become and really is a tyrannical lockdown. Gabriel, let me come to you, actually, first, because I know you'll have something to say about this. Yeah, I mean, can you trust Nkosa Zanat Lamini Zuma? If you had any doubt on the basis of her performance uh, at the AU and before that with the ANC, just look at her performance as Cochter Minister. In August this year, she tried to postpone the election by proclaiming the election before there was registration, disenfranchising hundreds of thousands of South Africans, saying she had to do it legally, which two days before she'd already written a letter to show that she knew that wasn't true. And yet that you know, little fish hook was swallowed by uh, way too many journalists without question. Um, and ultimately what she said she was doing is trying to help the IEC out to make sure that we don't have an election. On what basis? On the basis that November is going to be a, a peak of COVID and, and, you know, the sky is going to fall out of the clouds and we're all going to die and it's very, very terrible. Despite the fact that all the scientists have said you can expect a trough, what happened? We had a nice trough. It was the best time to vote. If you look over the last month, 0 0.6 per million per day, South Africans have died of COVID-19. If you look on an any average day, it's like 23 South Africans die per million per day. So this is two orders of magnitude less than the average daily deaths. And if you compare this to the second peak, it's 10 times less, maybe 15 times less. Like if you compare this to global, we have five times fewer deaths than the United Kingdom per day, per million population. And yet they had Freedom Day in August or September where they ended the last domestic restrictions and they are going about their business. They're trying to get their economy regrowing. They're trying to get the working class back in a good shape. We are a much poorer country who can much less afford lockdown. We have half a death per million per day. I mean, it's like you can't see it on the overall pie chart of daily death. There are so many other deaths that, that the government should be concerned about, but it's not. Uh, what we have is a curfew between midnight and 5 a.m. because that's when COVID, you know, the science says that's when COVID comes out to play. So it's just waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, this is, you know, I just like, Sitle, you know, you, you end your podcast by saying never trust a commie. Dude, you can't trust someone who literally said at the start of this thing, it's time for Cabral S. class suicide. Mm. Mm. Nkosa Zana. Kochta Minister Dlamini Zuma is in charge of endlessly extending this thing. So just shout out to the IRR. I've got some IRR colleagues here. If you want to help <clears> us stop this, please sign up to our petition. We've got well over 10,000 signatures. We're writing letters. We've already written to the president last week. We're writing to the command council. We're writing to the minister. Our attorneys are, are currently uh, getting through the final draft. We're laying a paper trail. If we need to go to court, we're trying to build public enthusiasm for putting this thing to bed. We're grown up South Africans. The government's position is not to tell us when we have to go to sleep and when we're allowed to go to work or go for a jog. Okay, that's got to be our own decision to make. Uh, the state of disaster is absolutely absurd and it's setting up a precedent for much worse things to come. If we can't get rid of this thing now, we're just giving the command council the sign that South Africa is too weak to stop uh, Cabral-esque class suicide. <laughs> absolutely. And by the way, you know, Gabriel, you're damn right on this particular topic. In so far as I've been warning people countless times that actually at some stage you need to draw the line in the sand. You can't keep waiting for some savior out there who's going to come swoop in 
and maybe with billions of rands fight this matter in court, blah, blah, blah. No, those billions of rands, or rather, let me not be hyperbolic, but those, those hundreds of thousands of rands, maybe even a few millions of rands, need to be come out from us, the ordinary citizens, in supporting those organizations that are fighting the good fight. Those organizations who still remember that we are a free society, damn it, and that in a free society, it is us, the citizenry, who decide on the course of things, not the political elites, not to Buffalo Bill, not to Buffalo Soldier, her colleague, the president, not to the ass at Peggy Taylor. I can go down the line in the nicknames that I've developed on the show and guess when these nicknames developed? When they instituted this lockdown nonsense. And it actually is nonsense because ask yourself the question how many people have been helped versus how many people have been hurt by this lockdown and is COVID-19 really 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 at the center of some of the things we're seeing being imposed on us and does this not form the beginning of that slippery slope speaking about that slippery slope Koketo, I must come to you because we've had this conversation about the danger of this particular lockdown and it's how it's seemingly the normalizing it of it all. The normalizing of the idea that I, a grown adult, must be home before 12 with my thumb uh, firmly in my mouth because Baba, uh, the family meeting, Buffalo Soldier has told me that I need to be home at this time. Okay, so it's condescending. <laughs> It is condescending. Probably the biggest thing that I've come to realize, and I'm not alone in this either, is, is how, it, well, it looks like the majority of people here actually have the opinion that the government is really out for our best interests. That's mm. not true because, and I'll make an example, right? What are the active programs right now in actually bettering people's lives who have been, whose lives have been damaged by the lockdown? You know, again, remember, we didn't ask for lockdown. You know, um, we were told that there's a presidential address uh, late March in 2020. We, we all glued to our TVs. You know, we're told it's a 21 day lockdown. But what are the active programs that are actually going to improve the citizenry? You know, we have actually we haven't seen much, you know, um, 350 rand per day. I can tell you right now that go get any job. Absolutely any job, the lowest job you can find, and it's going to give you more than 350 rand in a month. And that's mm -hmm. the simple fact, you know. Uh, but people believe that the government really has our best interests at heart. If the government did, they wouldn't make it so difficult for you to find a job. If they didn't do that, we wouldn't have such a high unemployment, which made world headlines just a few weeks ago. So all of that considered, right, it's really time that we do actually fight back. And I say, mm -hmm. and I'm putting the squarely on the government. I know that we like to, uh, you know, have a hyper focus on Gosazana Tamini Zuma quite a lot, uh, rightfully so. But again, I don't think she makes these decisions alone. These are executive decisions of which at that round table is the president uh, and some other in that close circle as well. So again, uh, this is a collective decision by the ruling party, our ruling government. Mm -hmm. They take this decision and the people at the end of the day who suffer is you and I. I don't think the curfew extends to government ministers, for example, right? Even under level five, we saw how some of them were freely traveling around. Uh, one uh, one style under Billy Abrams, even visiting a friend who was a former deputy minister. He wasn't a deputy minister at the time, not a government official, of course. But she was visiting a friend while you and I were supposed to be penned like sheep behind our closed doors. Uh, so these rules don't apply to them. But if they really had our best interests at heart, you'd see a lot more programs with regard to kickstarting the economy. We aren't hearing any of that. Instead, at every opportunity, we are told about how the government is going to what, build, uh, you know, rebuild the society. How do you trust a, a ruling party that has built nothing to rebuild what is actually crumbling? You know, mm. it doesn't make sense. Show me what the ANC has built, and then I'll take it from there and say, right, given their capacity to build ABC, perhaps we can then trust them with rebuilding what is currently there. They don't have that right now. Our water infrastructure is going down the drain. We know the story with ESCOM. I don't need to go further on that. Uh, look mm -hmm. at uh, you know, the Labour Minister as well, who's, quite frankly, I believe he's just sitting on his hands, getting his chair <clears> from <throat> 9 to 5. I don't think he actually sits down and works. You know, every time he comes out, it's always some commie-related policy. I don't blame him. He is a registered member of the Communist Party after all. But that's our labor minister. You know, So where are these policies that are in designed to make our lives a little bit better, to help us weather the storm, which necessitates the state of disaster that Nkosazan Adlamini Zuma keeps extending in perpetuity? None of them Absolutely. exist. We told, no, here's 350 rand a month and uh, yeah, uh, go out there and live your best life. I don't think that's actually possible with 350 rand a month for a lot of people. But again, I say 
go and get a job, any job, beg on the side of the road even, that will get you more than 350 rand a month. I would go even one step further, Coquette, as I bring this to Martin from Staden. Instead of where are the policies, where is the freedom, damn it? Where is the freedom? Where is the ability to allow the ordinary individual to pursue their own happiness, to find their own way in this planet? Why is there a belief? Why is there a belief that some politician somehow knows better for me, whether I'm a chap who lives in that shack on a sand dune in Cape Town that I often talk about, or even if I'm a privileged young man who goes to some of the most elite schools in the country, how is it possible that in a country of millions of transactions on a daily basis, a country of millions of South Africans each with their own volitions, own thoughts, own desires, who wake up every day pursuing their own desire to, to do something to make a living for themselves, that somehow a politician in Pretoria knows best for everybody in this particular circumstance. It's that which I find laughable, Martin, and it's, it's that which Ukokets is making the right point, which we need to divorce ourselves from the belief of. Hmm. Yeah, someone recently made the point that uh, unemployment is actually an artificial state of humanity. Uh, uh, the nature of, of economics is that humanity has infinite desires, infinite needs. And the way uh, you make money, the way you get ahead is by answering these needs, by supplying your fellow man of what they desire. So uh, in actual fact, the, the, whole in, the whole phenomenon of unemployment is actually quite inconceivable uh, if, if uh, uh, in the absence of some kind of impos imposition. Now, I mean, we, we all know that COVID is a, a serious disease. I think many of us have had it. I think maybe all of us have lost someone close to us from it. Uh, uh, I don't think uh, anyone is, is now saved from that. It's definitely a serious condition. But what we have seen around the world is that lockdowns have very, very, uh, very negligible or any at all relationship to, to uh, stopping this uh, virus from spreading. Uh, Sweden is, of course, the, the best example of that, having had considerably fewer deaths than the United Kingdom, which is a close neighbor, which had an extremely uh, uh, harsh lockdown. South Africa is one of the world's hardest hit COVID countries. Uh, and we had an, uh, uh, one of the, the world's hardest initial lockdowns. Uh, it simply does not work. It's, it's, it's really just, uh, uh, I, I guess, a game that the government is playing to show how decisive the leadership of Cyril Ramaphosa is, which the media really uh, uh, praised him for uh, in the beginning. And I, I think there is still some of that left. Uh, and now we were at that point where everyone is acknowledging the, and I mean, this is happening in the United States now as well with, with their uh, consumer inflation also uh, going high with Biden saying, oh my goodness, yeah, it's, it's the pandemic. It's, it, it's the pandemic that did this to us. Please don't, don't blame policy. Mm. But you see this in South Africa as well, where it's uh, government must help us move out of the pandemic when the, the economic disaster that has been wrought upon us has not been by the pandemic, serious as it is. It was simply by government's bone headed policy response to the pandemic that we are in this situation and that is why uh, I don't even want their 300 rand a month I want them immediately to uh, stop whatever they, they, they're doing and whatever they're planning on doing and really let South Africans uh, get pull themselves out of the mess that the government has started because at the end of the day you can really only trust yourself, your community, your family uh, and mm -hmm. community organizations and I mean the IRR uh, uh, the, the foremost liberal have been at the forefront of attacking uh, the lockdown and uh, today when NDZ announced the extension of the lockdown I saw that AfriForum also announced their own legal campaign against I think specifically the curfew so here you have conservatives also attacking the lockdown so uh, ver I think the whole political spectrum of, of, of normal ordinary non-elite non South Africans are now equally sick of this and have realized that listen we we need to solve this problem ourselves and we need to start by getting the government out of our way very, very quickly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Sarah, <clears throat> maybe as we, we tape off this, this part of the conversation, because I want us to move on, um, you know, it, it's reminding ourselves as South Africans of two things. One, never trust a commie, uh, yes, as I always say, but also don't trust people in government. People in government are not necessarily interested in you and your life. Uh, because they don't understand you and your life, right? You are an individual. You need to be given the freedom to make decisions and to take risks, by the way, which you deem as um, uh, appropriate for you and your own circumstances. Number two, this idea that somehow uh, 
you know, this, this, this thing can just be extended <clears throat> at, at infinitum has to be challenged in a legal sense. It, I think it has to be tested now in court. And again, I don't say this with a, a sense of high optimism because I've seen how some many on the bench uh, have also bought in to COVID, the, the branch COVIDian cult that is now developing around this nonsense. But it, it's time that the facts and the rationale uh, and the evidence and the data, by the way, start speaking much more than the fear of those who are afraid of COVID. I think you're absolutely correct about the government really doesn't know. They don't know how jobs work. They don't know how businesses work. They, they patronize the people. I mean, there was a lovely interview with a middle-aged woman in a town that Cyril Ramaphosa was visiting pre the election. And she was, she was an informal trader and she was complaining about the potholes in, 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 the, in the area where people were trading. And she, she wanted to, you know, she wanted him to come and have a look because it was, do, it, the problem was it was hindering the supply of goods to her to sell on, and it was hindering the, the, the opportunity for people to be her customers. Now, mm. you know, we, we're in exactly the same position. I mean, that's how things work. But the problem is that you've got a, a, a government who's wedded to ideology. Um, mm. it's cloud, let's be honest, it's cloud cuckoo land stuff. And I think the idea that they're hanging on to the, 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 the disaster uh, situation is a way of having control and yet despite all the control, despite the bypassing of parliament, it doesn't help to actually get anything done because the policy making is, is not there, the understanding is not there, the, uh, everything is not there that, that people need and understand for themselves. And it's, uh, but it's, 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 our, it's our situation writ large. Um, mm. And it was reflected, I think, in the results of the election. To a very large extent, I wanted to get go there because uh, you know the, 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 this last election for me was was beautiful. It was beautiful because, to a large extent, it it, it was almost like that movie with George Clooney, um, the Perfect Storm. You remember that movie where the, the three storm systems came together at one time and they were out at sea and they were caught in the middle of that. And there's that last scene where it's like George Clooney's behind the the steering wheel and he's got full power and he's trying to go up the wave. Um, and the whole thing is super desperate, and it feels like that's exactly where we are at the moment. We're in that last bit where the engine peters out, and you're suspended in that little moment. And Peggy, the analogy here is a South African populace who are suspended and can feel gravity beginning to pull us back and into a crashing wave. The numbers tell the story, Peggy, of this lockdown. The unemployment, um, the, the decline generally in our economy. Most definitely, Cecilia. There's an important point that you've touched on as well as uh, what others have touched on, and that is the increased amount of, level, uh, of poverty levels in the country. Uh, South Africa is a trend outlier when you look at unemployment levels in the country. We now have more people unemployed in the country than we did in 2019, and it doesn't, there's no hopes of those numbers recovering back. There's about 11 million people unemployed. That's under the expanded definition, which includes discouraged work seekers. These are people that have uh, given up the prospects for employment, largely due to employment opportunities in the country being on a great decline. And that's because for a decade long, the government has been following hostile policies that have been detrimental to the South African economy, and that has led to an extreme increase in the amount of people that are economically excluded. And when you compare us to other countries, like emerging countries, uh, their employment levels are sitting at 60%. South Africa's employment levels are at 40% far below that of emerging markets and far below that of developed markets at 70, 80%. And the consequences of this issue is that these people express their frustrations, unfortunately, through protests, through violent protests, the likes that we saw in July. And unfortunately, if the core issues are not addressed, unfortunately, we may then start to see those violent protests start to increase, which have increased by about 400% since 2007. So that's the, that's the thing that the ANC is unwilling to address. And that's the thing that uh, we also saw in last week's uh, midterm statement that the core issues mm -hmm. that people face on a daily basis, uh, the ANC has no political will to address those issues. And maybe let's, let's, let's smoothly transition into that particular issue, because really it was one of those areas where I wanted us to tackle 
um, and, 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 and form the bulk of the conversation around because it's bread and butter, guys. It's bread and butter. When you talk about midterm poli uh, budget policy statements, which often people graze over when you even try to get that, uh, that, that whole name out of the MTPBS, uh, pardon me, MTBPS acronym, uh, people glaze over. But I'm like, no, don't, because a lot of what Uene Godongwana, the new finance minister, was speaking about in the policy statement is where the ever dwindling state funds uh, will be spent in this country, or at least where they intend to, sp uh, to spend, because really politicians are really good at asking us to judge them by their intentions and not necessarily by their outcomes. But hey, that's a conversation by not for another day. Um, but let's actually unpack this MTB PS, uh, or big, and I'll actually begin with you um, in that particular regard. Uh, a broad overview, what did we hear in this speech? Why, why was it important for the average South African? What was in it? Yeah, so the important thing with the medium state uh, uh, statement that was tabled last week by Ino Pangwana is the, essentially the management of taxpayers' funds. As much as it is referred to as government finances, this is not government finances. This is the ordinary South Africans' finances. And in the state, the national treasury, states where this money will be spent. In other words, where your money will go and where exactly they will collect your funds from. And what we saw last week is that Enoch Wanawana tabled a best than expected statement. That was a, an update from the February budget due to commodity rally. But if you look beyond to how he uh, projected his, his update, you look beyond the commodity rally, things are not looking that rosemary uh, In fact, if you look at GDP forecast by the National, uh, by the national Treasury, a GDP forecast for this year is estimated at 5.1%. That's really due to the low base effect of last year. But the three-year average is sitting at 1.7%. That's extremely low. And that's because they're admitting themselves that uh, the reforms that they talk about, such things as spectrum release, uh, the reduction of business on rent tape on businesses, which is needed, will not amount to substantial economic growth levels in the country. And they are unwilling to touch on those things, uh, unfortunately. Another important factor this is the deficit levels that the country is currently in. The budget deficit is the difference between how much the government spends and, 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 and the difference between how much the government spends to that of how much it receives in tax revenue collection. That's currently projected to be at 8%. That is extremely high when you look at a 100-year level. And that adds to our debt levels, which are currently now sitting at 70%, which have been revised lower due to the rebasing of GDP. That unfortunately has the same consequence as an ordinary household that acquires a, a huge amounts of debt levels. When you go to a bank and you try to seek another loan, uh, they ask for a higher interest rate because they see you as a high risk. And that's exactly what we see in South Africa. When you look at debt servicing costs, it's becoming more expensive for the government to then acquire more debt because it has such uh, enormous amounts of debt levels in the country. In fact, debt levels in the country uh, are projected to increase to 353 billion in the year 2024, which is close to what we spend on education at 360 billion. That is utter madness. That's crowding off from important things such as healthcare, such as, uh, for example, policing, as well as that of education. Uh, and the, what I saw from uh, last week's update is that the ANC is simply unwilling to uh, fundamentally implement reform measures. Uh, such as that of the labor market. The country is facing a youth unemployment rate of about 75%. With such high youth unemployment rates, it's utterly reckless to implement uh, wage, uh, minimum wages that we see in the country. Uh, and they're unwilling to address the privatization of SOEs. You know, it's a real, we need to see the increase in capacity of electricity generation in the country, which has capped GDP at 1%. But there's no political willingness to actually involve the private sector to increase electricity generation, as well as that of absolutely scrapping expropriation of property without compensation, which is detrimental to the South African economy. Not only that, but also to the uh, fiscal, to the national treasury, how they collect revenue when you look at the de uh, decreasing amounts of investment levels in the country. So what I saw, Cecilia, my sum up of what I saw last week was business as usual, uh, we're not going to address the core issues that face the ordinary South African. We're just going to continue the way that we've continued for the past decade, uh, not really looking at uh, policies that will actually help the South African economy grow, instead following the ones that are detrimental to economic growth. If you're just joining us, welcome to it. We're at that 30-minute mark 
here on Liberty and Friends. Remember, this is a 90-minute show, so you still have time. Welcome to it. Get yourself something cold, seemingly, to drink and join the discussion because, hey, hey, that's she is a lot. We're unpacking the MTP, uh, MTB, pardon me, PS budget, uh, budget um, uh, policy statement, which the finance minister delivered last week. You want to pay attention to this because it's your money, as Upegi just finished explaining, that is being spent here. What are they spending on? Uh, spending it on? Are they running up a debt bill which you will have to pay? Where's the inflation outlook looking in this country? And remember, inflation affecting you once again because the cost of things seems to be getting higher and higher. We're in, uh, you're watching Liberty and Friends, and we're having that conversation. Speaking about a conversation, if you like this conversation, hey man, hit the like button. That my likes are nowhere near where they should be. We're seeing good numbers of people joining the show, but the likes are nowhere near the engagement level that I want. I want 50% engagement. So if there's 100 people watching, I want my 50 likes, people. Get my likes in. Get my likes. Hit that like button right now. In fact, there is a kid in Ethiopia starving, waiting for you to hit that like button. That's not true, but hey, hit the like button nonetheless. <laughs> Welcome to it. This is Liberty and Friends. I'm going to come back to where and then I'll transition to Gabriel. Because I think there's quite a few uh, nuggets that Uubegi um, unpacked here that are critically important. Number one, it's this idea that actually, and maybe just the philosophy of it first before we go into some detail. I think a myth has been birthed inadvert inadvertently in this country. The myth being, number one, yes, politicians won't, can't save you, but also B, government spending won't save you because seemingly the spending in and of itself becomes more of a burden on you, the guy who makes the money in this society, um, versus it being, um, I, 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 economists call it uh, concentrated benefits and dispersed costs. It's the idea that um, those who are uh, at the closest proximity of where the spending happens are very happy, happy by, um, you know, with uh, what the, minute, the finance minister would have said last week, because they know that money is coming to them because they are a concentrated group of people. But for those of us who form the majority, who don't really benefit from the spending, it is a cost that is dispersed on us. Yeah, and and again, uh, this message, I don't, it needs to be said and will always be repeated by not just me, but many others out there in that the unemployed need to get employed. It's that simple. There needs to be no superhero uh, with a big G on their chest to say, right, government is coming to save you, you know? The unemployed need to be employed so they cannot be a welfare burden to the state, but more importantly, not be a tax burden to the dwindling number of those who are employed. It's getting out of control. Um, again, I don't have the data. Perhaps the panel can help me out here. But again, you know, I, we've, we're quickly getting to the point if we haven't crossed that line yet where... Not only is it not sustainable, but it's actually, yeah, it's almost in terminal decline there, how those who do work, are they're few in number, and on their shoulders is such a burden, you know, over and above everything, uh, over and above the rising uh, government, to, uh, government uh, debt ratio, over and above that, and then we still have promises being made to those who are poor. How about promises being made along the lines of, right, uh, you can now open a business with basically no red tape at all. Now, how about uh, infrastructure spending goes to parts of the community where Umama is selling fruits, for example, you know, so you can better, uh, so you can better those areas, you know, put a roof over there, you know, uh, actually make the stalls something uh, very lookable, something that is, you know, quite, uh, qu quite, quite appealing to someone to actually get in their car and go and drive there instead of maybe a supermarket. None of that is being done. And what really makes it worse here is that, you know, people are people know that, you know, they can't really depend on the government. But when they do try to go out there and actually make a plan for themselves, uh, they've they essentially shot back down by government policy. And then on top of that, uh, they shot back down also by, you know, the, the sheer inability to do business because, again, lack of access to capital and the likes. But even over and above that, they can't do business because they can't compete in a market that isn't designed for someone to actually come in and start eking out a living. So some of this uh, messaging really needs to be said. And at every opportunity, 
what all we hearing really is, you know, social programs that are designed to empower the poor, to empower the black youth. The black youth need to get jobs. And the, the longer we go without them being employed, the higher the propensity of black youth to be, actually be unemployable. You know, uh, given the way everything is going and the kind of skills needed in this modern age, right? If someone doesn't get a start ASAP, they can easily be left behind, way behind the curve, exactly. where we'll find ourselves in a position where you can't actually employ them because they legitimately lack the requisite skills and you can't even afford to put someone in and teach them those skills because, again, now there's a minimum wage staring at you right in the face. You know, the cost of business is high for existing businesses and the cost of entry is high for those who want to start a business as well. I see there's a comment there that, you know, education, uh, basically decent education is something to factor in. Yeah, of course it is, you know, but again, what's happening with education, uh, the standards are being lowered even in there as well, you know, to make themselves look good by putting lipstick on the pig of dwindling education results you know, at an objective level, uh, what is government doing? They're lowering the standards and then doing the necessary mental gymnastics to, uh, you know, to justify why they do this. Meanwhile, in the market, in the actual market, right, things don't change. You need to be competitive. Uh, no one cares about, you know, uh, what kind of mark you got. You know, it, it doesn't matter what your mark was in, 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 in school. You know, if you can do the job, you can do the job. If you can't do the job, you can't. If you're a teachable person, you're teachable. And if you're unteachable, uh, you know, it will actually come back to bite you. But the government seems to think that, you know, uh, a matriculant must actually go around the country uh, holding a big P on their forehead to show everyone that they've passed matric. That's not what the market is looking for. The market is looking for skills. And unfortunately, our education system doesn't build out into those skills. And our economic and labor policies uh, don't actually uh, encourage me taking someone under my wing as a business owner, for example, and then teaching them those skills. Yes, they'll earn low in the beginning, but again, which successful businessman has ever said that they started not at the bottom, but somewhere near the top? Mm. A again, you raise critical points, and I want to come to Gabriel for some of them, <clears throat> because I think that's the part that's missing from the conversation. There is a conversation which dominates the corporate media, which dominates uh, the commentariat in this country, dominates even the academic chattering classes, but there is an even simpler equation which is missed by everybody. And all it takes you to do is to walk down main streets of South Africa, walk down downtown of South Africa, which is if you give me the freedom to trade, the freedom to trade and the opportunity by simply getting out of my way and not putting in place burdens, uh, barriers that I must traverse on a day-to-day -day basis, I will find my own means, damn it, is what the ordinary South African is telling these politicians. And that, yes, it won't look pretty, I won't be Sol Kersner, I won't be Patrice Mazepe, but I will be the guy who's able to put bread on my table at the end of the month. So shove your spending, dear government. Give me the opportunity to make the income. From that income, build savings. From those savings, pay for things that I need. Dude, so true. I mean, if I can just riff here on Gigi Alcock, uh, author of Cosinomics and the like. Uh, he's an old family friend. Uh, born in Singa, KZN, grew up without shoes and speaking very traditional Zulu, uh, but he didn't look like your average Zulu, so he <laughs> covered a strange, uh, uh, strange trajectory. He writes, and he he actually uh, and his man Fats uh, took me on a few tours of the Kasi economy and drew out this wonderful history where after '94. The big retail companies thought it's too dangerous to go and set up a business inside Soweto or inside Alexandra or inside so many of the townships. And then suddenly they thought it had been like that. Suddenly they thought, no, 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 we can go and move in there because no one there knows how to trade. We'll get goods to market and everyone's going to love it. And yeah, there's one or two success stories. But if you drill down to the numbers and if you go and do the tours or you just live in a township, you know there are people there offering groceries, offering essentials at a cheaper price. Even though they don't have the economies of scale, they've got the hustle. I have been at, at like uh, super spazas where there's men with machine guns and uh, oaks on their cell phones trying to figure out where's the best place now to get maize and where's the best place now to get nappies and where's the place now to get Vicks, Vaporub. 
finding the best deals the whole time. Logistics are working the whole time. People are picking it up and dropping it off the whole time. And survey after survey, consumer-based price survey has shown that they can outcompete in terms of price value, in terms of business hours, in terms of services, and often in terms of the ability to extend no interest credit to customers that they know personally when that end of the month is coming, but you need a, a, a diaper and a grant is waiting, whatever. The, it's, it's so much good services provided by South Africans that have that space to operate within a relatively free market. Here's the nightmare. You can build your business up to like a small or medium business level. Um, if you're making 5 million rand a year as a business owner, you're still qualified as a small business. And that's because if you think about it, after operating costs, after labor costs, you, you're probably coming up with a few hundred thousand rand. That's wonderful, but it's like, you know, it's nowhere near Saul Kersner or whatever. The next step to really add jobs is to go from being a small business to being a medium business, to go from that 5 million rand to that 20 million rand annual turnover, to go from 20 million rand to 200 million rand turnover. But it's at that stage that you no longer get to compete for customers. It's at that stage where you have to start competing basically for political patronage. It's at that stage where you need to start crossing the dots and uh, dotting your I's and, and, and jumping through the logistical hoops where you face regulators, where you face all kinds of red tape, where you face a finance industry that's worried about financing any business venture that seems a little bit exciting. Why? Because their own asset base is it the threat of major inflation? Is it the threat of expropriation without compensation? Is it the threat of a nationalized healthcare service? Is it the threat currently of a lockdown, which literally makes no sense? There's, I, I can't think of a single scientist in the whole world who thinks that what we are currently doing in terms of lockdown makes any sense. So that's the kind of, that's, that's where the big boys are playing. They're playing in this artificial system. And if I flip from the Kaisenomics universe to, uh, you know, someone I know, uh, who, who runs one of the biggest financial services companies in the country, he said, my biggest problem is complacency. I don't know how to inspire my staff to work hard because there are so many barriers to entry. We are running ourselves in an oligopoly. There are four co companies in this sector and nobody, but nobody is going to challenge us because nobody can get a license. Nobody can get in there with the right opportunities to outcompete us. So we are just getting fat sitting on our feathered nests. Has Enoch Gorongwana said anything to address those challenges? No. Look at the two biggest budget line items. Education. This is fundamental for the long term. The IRR has been championing this idea, and I'm sure our colleagues at the Free Market Foundation uh, uh, dig this kind of thing too because it's a classic uh, you know, good idea. South Africans that know how to hustle know how – to judge a school that is abusing their children by teaching them a bunch of rubbish. Know how to judge a school where the teachers don't show up on Friday because Puza Thursday and don't show up on Monday because Babalas Monday. That is, I mean, the stats on absenteeism in South African schools are literally off the charts. You, I, I, I saw an international study where they had to rebase it just to like quantify how many South African teachers don't show up to school. It's unnatural. <laughs> And why? It's because you don't get to choose, in effect, what school you send your kids to. If you had tax-funded vouchers where parents could say, I can send my kid to African School of Excellence. I can send my kid to Sakura. I can send my kid to a low-cost private school where if they stop doing the job, I can pull that money back, put it somewhere else, and the taxpayer is investing in that. I would love some of my taxes to go to that rather than some Satu trade unionist sitting on his or her bum kind of mouthing off about how terrible the past was while being Very too used point. to go to school, I would much rather my money and our money is being directed mm -hmm. and actually putting children, putting knowledge in their minds, putting discipline in their daily structure, giving them the skills that they need to grow. That's the first line item. I'll just finish with the second line item. It is the debt. The second, we are spending, if you add SOEs, look, without SOEs, it's like 330 billion rand a year. Add in the SOEs, it's, it's more. It's more than a billion rand a day. Every single day of the year, a billion rand that could be going to education, that could be going to filling potholes, that could be going to making the economy better for those Cassianomics guys to graduate into the big leagues. Every single day, that money is going to bondholders. And South Africa has the most volatile bond market in the world because if you're a cowboy in Tokyo or San Francisco 
or Berlin and you want to make money on the swing, you can buy the bonds here, sell the bonds there, buy them here, sell them there. That's where our money's going. A billion a day. And has anything been done to address that in a serious way? Literally worse than nothing. It's only going to get worse. Tito and Boweni describe it like a crocodile, where the amount we're taking in is going flat and the amount we're spending is going up. And he said, you've got to close the crocodile's mouth. That's the crocodile of government debt, just growing and growing to eat all of our futures. All mm. of our futures. That mouth is gaping. Apt, apt, apt analogy there. And again, you touched on points that Upegi raised at the very beginning. The idea that you need that conflational, that coming together of reform on the one hand, um, you know, actual policy ideas that are geared towards empowering the individual, less spending that goes to, as you rightly point out, Gabriel, as is the case with Satu, for example, on education, less spending that goes to cronies, less spending that goes to political um, elites, effectively. That's in fact kind of what they are, not kind of, that's exactly what they are, political elites. And actually spending, if you do spend anything, that literally puts the money back into the hands of the individual and says, you decide what your future is. And vouchers, of course, are a lovely stopgap because, again, no one's saying that, you know, because um, that's the usual refrain we'll get, oh, you know, ah, there you go, there go those libertarians and those classical liberals, um, you know, saying that uh, government spending in the, the, the midterm policy budget statement uh, should be just cut off, you know, and let the poor fend for themselves, blah, blah, blah. This is the usual criticism, Martin, that we're often here being directed at us. But we're saying, no, if you are going to spend the money um, in, as a stopgap, which is an expression I've heard being used. In other words, recognizing that, you know, there are people who are literally cannot be weaned off of this uh, uh, instantly, then do it in a much more smarter way that empowers that individual and allows them to become competitive. Because I can tell you now, the world doesn't owe us and anybody any understanding. You must compete. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, very, very few libertarians, even the, the radical anarchists, believe in immediately stopping all government spending in a day and then just uh, praying to God. That's 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 definitely not been my experience. Uh, libertarians do actually have some basic economic knowledge and know that that would be a total disaster. Uh, uh, so that's that's certainly not the idea, the the the, the voucher idea. Uh, and, and also, uh, I mean, this is something that's now getting popular in South Africa, this idea of a universal basic income grant. Uh, mm. This is something that Milton Friedman was was quite keen on, subject to a very important proviso, and that is that all other welfare needs to be replaced by a, a single universal basic income grant that, uh, that people can spend uh, any way they want. And uh, now this is uh, Milton Friedman, the, 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 uh, the guy the, le the left would accuse of being Satan himself uh, as far as economics goes. So uh, no, that's, that's absolutely incorrect. Um, but, but more fundamentally, and this is something that I, I think our, our opponents, uh, they betray themselves a little bit there and, and show their, um, I guess, their, their condescension for the poor. And that is that they assume that in the absence of government assistance, the poor will just sit down and roll over and die and then just uh, 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 be blown away with the wind. And that is, of course, not the case. Now, the, the, the fact of the matter is, and I, I, go, I quite go out on a limb saying this, um, is that our poverty in South Africa, and I would say poverty throughout Africa, is simply the result of government uh, excessive government interference in the economy. Uh, right. It's it's not it, it's no uh, global economic condition or uh, Western European governments extracting minerals from Africa and stealing our wealth from us and keeping us poor. That is simply not it. Uh, that is those are academic arguments that have no basis in reality. The reason we have millions of poor South Africans is because they cannot simply walk down the road and get a job. Uh, the reason we have uh, poor South Africans is because when they need to buy goods, those prices are inflated because of protectionism. Uh, mm -hmm. Some you put a put a comment on here that uh, f uh, the fuel price is now 19 rand 50. Uh, about 40 percent of that goes directly into government's pocket. Uh, so we could be paying significantly less for uh, for fuel uh, in this country, and that has a, a very s a significant down downstream effect on the, the, the prices of all goods. Um, so even if you cut off all welfare right now, which no one is suggesting, uh, it, it won't simply be the case that the poor will just 
uh, be left to die. The Ooh. poor will not be poor for long if that is to happen. If we have a truly free market, there will be uh, uh, out of out of sheer necessity, the people of South Africa will employ themselves. They will be mm. entrepreneurial. This is what if if uh, if you go to Nigeria, uh, uh, which I which I do enjoy, uh, uh, and 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 Kenya. I've been to Kenya twice now. You see this. Everywhere else in Africa, people do not get a lick of government welfare there. On paper, African governments are these huge welfare states. They, they, the people who live in those countries get nothing, zip. Uh, but yet, they are all extremely entrepreneurial. Uh, you see uh, stores on the side of the road uh, everywhere. Uh, nobody listens to government rules there. It's, it's, a, it's a libertarian paradise in, in many ways. Uh, the, the reason those countries remain poor is that you cannot really graduate beyond uh, a very uh, a basic subsistence living because the rule of law is totally absent. Uh, mm. The corruption is the name of the game. So you, you know, I'm not saying we need to become like that. But if you if you look at the the culture that that the, the global poor and you see this in East Asia as well have is that in the absence of government they do not just die. They they do they do provide for themselves because they're not stupid. They're, they're human beings who need to live. And as, as uh, we point out on the show very often, uh, 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 people know best for themselves. Uh, this is simply a, a reality that cannot, uh, that no government, no matter how filled to the brim of experts it is, can ever escape. So uh, uh, if, if this were to be true, that we believe that, uh, uh, the minister should just announce, yeah, we're closing, we're closing the whole thing down. Uh, I don't think that'll be the end of the world. I, I think it, it would be economically disastrous, maybe, for in, in many ways, but it, it won't be the end of, of South Africa's poor. Um, but of course, our suggestion of, of vouchers, uh, Gabriel is entirely correct there, of a universal basic income uh, that, uh, that replaces all other welfare uh, as transitional measures. These things have been long been proposed by, by libertarians and, and classical liberals. Uh, and, and then just uh, on a, uh, to close my thought off here, so one of the co commenters said that he's unsubscribing from the show because it's so clear to him that there is no hope and um, the ANC is always going to be like this and, and it's, it's, what's the use? Uh, I always bang on about this. Please, guys, do not be defeatist. Uh, things are changing in South Africa right before our eyes. The ANC has now gotten under a, a majority in, a, in, a, in an election. It's not a national election yet, but this is a very clear indication that the mentality is shifting. Uh, uh, and, and also uh, beyond that, beyond the political realm, uh, we have communities really coming together now in the face of this uh, hopeless state of politics really coming together and saying yeah we'll do it ourselves so uh, you do you government we're gonna we're gonna take care of ourselves there's no reason to be despondent right now uh, there's every reason to be to be uh, uh, positive and to to work hard to make sure that uh, the the potential of our future can be realized and it can be realized there's nothing impossible about it so so drop the defeatism and and uh, let's let's work together and do it I fully agree with that. And I've always been saying this, that you have to be at the helm, dear South African, of leading the charge, if you will, of changing your society. All South Africa really needs, and I've said this before, so I'll come to you in a moment. All South Africa needs is a small band of, of people, devoted people, nothing more than 10% even of the population, if I can, if I can give it a, a random number. And I've heard even though Martin alludes to a similar ratio, with an idea, a small band of people with an idea to conduct a march through the institutions of society, government, and of course, of, of us and our communities, and to change those institutions. So you you are part of it. Don't don't be despondent, don't be defeatist. I would agree. Sarah, I'm gonna have you give us the last word on this section because I want us to move on. Um, but there is a conversation here to be had, and I think you could, one can almost pick it up given the spectrum of commentary we've just run through now, that there is a big disjuncture, a big chasm that's developing between what the politicians say and the politicians blah, blah, uh, whether they're a finance minister or whatever the case may be, versus what ordinary South Africans are faced with. Well, I think it's at this juncture where ordinary South Africans have basically uh, an instinctive free market approach to their lives. They, they, they know what needs to be done to, to improve their lives. Um, it's, the opportunities are not necessarily there, but the government does, doesn't understand it. So we, 
we have this extraordinary period of nearly 30 years of following economic policies that make us an outlier amongst developing nations. They are not successful. I mean, they're not worse than not successful. They're appalling. And the what you end up with is you, you've got this situation where there are two things that I just wanted to point out. The one is that you, you've got this huge government debt, and yet your income from, from taxes is dropping, and your income from taxes is dropping because your tax base is contracting. Or either people are leaving, or they're trying to get out of having to pay huge amounts of tax, or they've lost jobs and, and are not much to, to the payment of taxation. So the pool just shrinks, and it can only unshrink if you put in place the right policies, which have basic, at the base of them freedom. And the other thing is, we're talking about the, the, um, the, the minimum wage. Given how bad our education system is and how ill-equipped youngsters are to get into the job market, you've got to essentially make it as cheap for somebody as possible to employ someone who, if they take the opportunity, it is an opportunity to get onto the first rung of the ladder. If you don't get onto the ladder, you're not going you, you, to... Your, your, your life will be immiserated. And I think the, I think the government doesn't understand that. It doesn't understand that a man who's a, a professional house painter will have two apprentices. Those guys are learning something. A service is being provided. Every person who learns then beca can become an employer himself or can run his own business. It takes time. It takes experience. There are no quick fixes. But mm -hmm. the, part of the way to get going is get out of our way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Speaking about getting out of the way, time is beginning to get out of our way. There's a terrible transition. I'm sorry. Uh, forgive me, dear viewer. Uh, <laughs> but we are in the last 30 minutes of the show. Welcome to it. This is Liberty and Friends. Folks, get my likes up, please. I'm looking at the numbers. The numbers are nowhere near where should be, uh, where they should be. Pardon me. There's about 245, nearly 250 of us watching across the platforms. Hit, please that like button and get them up, get them up, get them up. Um, with that being said, welcome to This is Liberty and Friends. I'm in conversation with Bagheti, with Ukoketo Resane, one third of the fellas out at MM Patria podcast. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to their show on a YouTube. Now, there he is, Gabriel Krause, the fellow, of course, who's one half of the two crickets in the thorn tree uh, podcast. Make sure you find them, of course, via the Daily Friend website. Um, speaking about Daily Friend, Sarah Gon, the editor-in-chief of the Daily Friend. That's www.dailyfriend.co.za. Get the numbers up, folks. Um, make sure you hit the subscribe and the like and the just make it your daily go-to for news analysis and opinion. That's dailyfriend.co.za. Martin van Staden, Free Market Foundation chap, and of course, also with the Sarke Lecha, uh, fellas out there doing some fantastic work. So if you're a small business individual, man, maybe reach out to Sarkilia and see what they can do for you out in that part of the world. Shout out to uh, the fellas out in Pretoria there at Sarkilia, or I should say Centurion, pardon me. Um, Peggy Machobo, um, who is, of course, analyst at the Center for Risk Analysis. That's who we're cooking with up in here. And uh, we're cooking with Greece. Welcome to it. This is Liberty and Friends. Fellas, and lady, uh, since I'll be accused of, are you assuming my gender? Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, let, let, let's, let's transition the conversation. And I did warn uh, my panel that, you know, given how bumper a bumper week it was uh, last week, we might not cover everything, but I must begin here. And we'll be brief here because I think I've touched on it in, in the previous vlog, vlog 120, you can find that on my channel. That is Miss South Africa, or Ulalela Mswane. This young lady wins this, um, the, the crown of being Miss SA and now is facing a barrage of bullying tactics by various interest groups who, in this country, are the, the people who hold a quote-unquote institutional power that you often hear the left argue that everybody else except themselves hold um, and which is lauded over them. But actually in this country, those who hold the anti-Israel uh, lobby, those who are the anti-Semites in many cases in this country are the ones who have the ear of people in power. They have the ear of politicians, the ear of government. And we saw it this week, Sarah, I'll begin with you, 
Um, and I'll let anybody else who wants to jump in on this one jump in. But we won't, we won't spend too much time on this one because I actually had Sarah on Vlog 120 where we discussed this issue. But Sarah, I must come to you in, insofar as it's been funny to watch. And really, not, I said funny not as in funny, haha, but funny as in rather scary. That those who hold power in our society, the loudest voices in the room, even though they're not the majority, punching down on this young lady, literally like a rag doll um, in a, a pit bull's mouth, you know, swaying mouth uh, side to side um, between those vicious teeth of the likes of Abu PDS, uh, Al Jamal went after her, um, the academic establishment in this country, who of course are anti-Israel. And of course, in this case, the ANC via the state um, pulling in support for this woman uh, as they did this, uh, this uh, last week, pardon me. Well, you see, the problem is that the, the Miss South Africa uh, pageant is a, private, is, is, a, is a private institution. So the government mm -hmm. has no control over what happens there. Now, whatever one may or may not think about beauty pageants, I think they survive because they are a means to, at least um, in terms of money and, and possessions, it's a, it's a means to development. It also gives, it gives a, a woman exposure. And it, it's, it's obviously big business. It's, it's, it's well-sponsored. Um, and obviously, the, 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 the great desire for the organizers and for the individual concerned is to get to a Miss World or a Miss Universe, uh, Miss Universe pageant. Now, the decision has been held to hold the Miss Universe pageant in Israel. And once again, the South African government is, again, an outlier in the sense that there has been increasing acceptance of Israel and not assuming, taking necessarily at face value um, the, the propaganda and the, and the really malicious um, and, and, and vicious propaganda against Israel. And that's, not to talk about anyone, any side being perfect, but it, it really is malicious. The, and the idea is that you really dump on a young woman who, who's not a fair with all the politics necessarily, and if you don't get anywhere with the, her, her organization, which apparently the Minister of Arts and Culture didn't, um, you, you, push, you push her. You make, you make her life miserable. But the, the thing is that the, Israel is a member of the, of the community of nations in the world. Mm. And it, 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 it is being increasingly recognized. I mean, South Africa was one of two or three countries that did not agree to Israel having observer status on the African Union. Now, that's mm. an indication that things are changing and as i say people are getting to better know what exactly the complexities of that uh, of that conflict are mm. but the, the problem the, the real problem is that the, the nature of the, the very deliberate nature and they've done it before the attack by various organizations and the, based on a you know israel's committed <clears throat> genocide and atrocities etc cetera, etc cetera. now whatever israel does it does, it neither can it has Conducts, has conducted genocide nor atrocities. But, you know, it, it's very much a propagandistic um, line that the, that, that the left and, the, uh, and certain parts of the Muslim community take on because you have... It, 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 the, the end game is a single state, the Jewish state shall not exist. Now, the Jewish state of not is not going to lie down and die, so it is going to put up resistance. And it's it, it's a it's a they, they've got away with it very very often um, and we've seen it happen with young women in other contexts as well and it, it's 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 rather it's it's grubby it's rather grubby because they're not contesting the ideas South Africa says shows it is very much in the only in the Palestinian camp and yet it supports a two-state solution now, all it's all of the the the, 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 the parties that it is it's, it allies with, such as Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, Fatah, etc. BDS, their goal is not a two-state solution. Their goal is a one-state yeah. solution with no Jewish state in existence. So, the very fact that you've got things like the Abraham Accords coming into play and the, the change of attitude in the Middle East, the recognition of some pragmatics, if nothing else, <coughs> um, suggests that. So they're being nasty, but it's not the way the average South African thinks about the issue. Although I saw a headline in, in I think it was the Daily Sun that says Mzanzi, Mzanzi dumps Miss South Africa. Well, it wasn't Mzanzi who dumped her. Um, and I think you've, they've, if they can ride out the noise, mm. 
they must they must do so because the the the, the opprobrium is is disproportionate, and I think in large parts of the practical world it's becoming apparent. And that's and, what I think. That, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I'm just saying. That I think that's what they're finding is the pushback. They're realizing, uh, for as much as they hold for institutional power, for as much as they are the voices, the loudest voices in the room, because they literally are state, or rather, they're in the government. Uh, they're in most of the um, political parties, that is the anti-Israel and even anti-Semitic lobby in this country. And for as much as they have the ear of the state, they're quickly realizing this country in, in a broader sense, a majority sense, actually supports the state of Israel. It's either warm to, uh, rather favorable to, or even straight out a zealot for the state of Israel. Um, and with that being said, it's, it's, it's always a funny thing to watch because I, I think your, your, your latter point is an important one as we wrap up this section. Um, I would argue if she's watching this right now, and I hope she watched the previous vlog, write out the noise because the overwhelming majority of South Africans recognize what's happening and are beginning to raise their voices in support of you. And what, what it really is here is not necessarily a Palestine versus Israel thing, but rather a freedom a support of your freedom to be where you want to be, to compete where you want to compete, and to not be harassed and bullied by people who literally um, are lording their power over you and are punching down on you, bullying you, and literally making you that Aunt Sally. I don't know if you remember that game, Aunt Sally. Maybe I'm old school here. Um, well, let me say a, a, a rag doll um, for uh, the abuse of these individuals. And it's not the first time, Gabriel, that we've seen these anti-Israel lobbies bully some of the weakest and more vulnerable amongst us. They literally were the ruthless to a one Shashi Naidu model who had expressed a correct sentiment around the appalling state of Gaza. And she was literally hounded and threatened. Death threats were sent to this woman by alleged BDS supporters to the extent where she had to get private security. And eventually out of pure fear, out of pure fear, dressed as revelation, she then apologized to the anti-Israel lobby, and of course, uh, the, uh, uh, no, what do you call it, uh, claims to support them now, out of pure fear, of course, dressed as revelation. The question I want to leave you with, uh, Gabriel, um, is why are they so afraid of individuals having the freedom to go see Israel for themselves? If you're going to claim that Israel is a apartheid state, or it segregates the races, or Arabs and Jews and all that nonsense, then why wouldn't you want the very people who you're trying to sell that BS story to, to go see for themselves? Because you don't believe the story. Exactly. Because you don't believe it for a single moment. Mm. Because you know, if you're, really, if you're really one of the gatekeepers here, that people who visit Israel are uh, going in with hostile views tend to come out with complicated views. And people who go in there with complicated views tend to come out with, like, complicated views. It's a complicated <laughs> place. And a great warm enthusiasm. I just want to say, quick point, La Lela Mswane is, like, much, but much better looking than Quentin de Kock. <laughs> but if you get past that superficial difference, they're in a very similar position. They're exactly. facing a hostile crowd that doesn't give a damn about freedom, that doesn't give a damn about giving a person a chance to compete at their best, express their conscience, make their way through the world. Uh, a worldview, they're competing against people whose worldview is literally as simple as this. You're either with us, you're either with us, or you are the enemy. Mm. Doesn't matter if you're a 20-year-old young lady who's, who's got the chance of a lifetime to appear on a on a global stage that you'll probably never get again, or uh, a seasoned sort of best wicket keeper batsman in the world going off to try mm -hmm. and win his country a World Cup. Doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Here's what matters. You're either with me or you are evil. That's a, I can, that, that worldview is as old as humanity. And um, my only hope, you know, de Kock, de Kock, uh, I don't know. I think he made it. I think, I think he caved before pressure. I think uh, uh, that is my view. We've discussed this. Different people disagree. That's fine. Um, I think he's generally a good guy and, and, and I, I wish him the best. I, I only hope that uh, uh, Mr. Mswane is, 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 is in a sufficiently fresh position 
that she can see through this. Like yeah. my, I think the magic bullet would be for someone to just, just put her on an airplane and go to Israel first and then let her make the decision. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I must move us on guys because sorry, I'm just pressed for time. I must apologize to the rest who may have wanted to say uh, something on this. But guys, last week, as I said, bumper, bumper Newsweek, and there's just two more issues I want us to chew on. Um, one is the, the Marty brothers, the, the boys out there in Pulukwane who had been for the longest time, a few weeks, in fact, um, being abducted and no one knowing where they are. Of course, the Moti family, I must be frank, um, not giving out much in the way of information also, on this issue, but definitely calling on a nation rightly um, to support them in that moment, a very difficult moment, and the nation did rally behind them. Okay, so I must come to you. Um, it really did rally behind them, including people offering all sorts of expertise in some cases to help find these boys, pointing out two broad things. Number one, the dangers that parents are facing on a day-to-day -day basis and evolving uh, cr uh, criminality in this country that literally targets people's kids now um, for, for, for hijacking. I must, oh, pardon me, not hijacking, wow, really? Um, which is funny because the, the father Kidnapping. owns a massive car dealership. So I hate that how those two things came together in my mind in a weird way. Um, my apologies to the Moti family, but for, for kidnapping, pardon me, of these kids. But yes, we're thankful the kids are back, but lots of questions. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, um, look, at the end of the day, right, uh, again, I'm not a parent, so, but I can imagine the kind of grief that parents face uh, the moment your child or children is missing. You know, it's not a nice place to be in, and this is, this is absolutely not the opportunity for people to then come out with, you know, their own theories behind uh, what happened to the kids, uh, why the kids were kidnapped, what kind of kidnapping this was, and any motive, ulterior motive, that sort of thing. It's really not the place to do that because at the end of the day, uh, the child, that's someone's child. You know, it's a lot mm. like uh, when someone passes away. You may not like the person, but that's still someone's father, someone's brother, you know, someone's husband. Similar thing with the kids here. So I didn't like how society, well, some, some, how some, some sectors of society responded to the kids being found. People drawing equivalents to, oh no, only those who are, you know, typically well off uh, get their children both A, found and B, uh, reported on by the media and the likes. It's okay to call out the media for not drawing out the problem we have with children disappearing, abductions, human trafficking, etc. But mm. again, there's that selective outrage I keep, uh, I keep bringing up uh, every now and then as well. You know, if there's such a problem of, say, media bias or even uh, bias at the police, South African police uh, services level, right? Why do you not? Why do you not? You know, apply the same sort of criticism across the board. Why do you reserve this criticism for a minority family uh, coming from maybe a wealthy background? You know, that's the kind of society that we're in. How did we get here? Because everything is polarized. Firstly, by race, of course, and then secondly, by uh, you know how much, uh, yeah, how much of an economic standing you're in. This mm -hmm. is not a nice place to be in as a country. Uh, this is certainly not where we want to continue. And I'm very disappointed to see that this is quickly how it went. But now mm -hmm. on that, right, questions has to be asked about, uh, I know the Moti family haven't given us much information, but again, questions have to be asked of the South African police service and what yeah. they're actually doing to protect children. Uh, and in the event that a crime happens to actually solve the crime, recover the children, etc because most of us don't have the kind of financial muscle to get our own private investigators and the <clears throat> like. Uh, most of us don't, re our hope is literally just that. It's hope, you know, it's hope, mm. not based on anything. Uh, there's no amount of money we can raise to help, uh, you know, to, to, to help recover uh, our, our lost children and the like. So this is really now square on the police to actually do their job for this. Where is the police in all of this? Nowhere to be seen, absolutely. It's not the police who recovered the Moti brothers. Uh, I can't remember exactly how they were found, but I heard the story was somewhere well, along the, the lines the, of... If, let me jump in here because it speaks to that particular point. Uh, they were effectively left at a particular location. The kids then went to a neighboring home to say, hi, we're, we're you know, 
this is what what just happened to us. That particular individual then called the police. So you're right, Coqueto. Saps in the grand scheme of things, insofar as what we know so far, we're really not in the loop on this particular yeah. issue. And, you know, as you make a comment, I'm going to come to Martin after this, because I want to look at that particular element, uh, Martin, the failure of law enforcement and how it has tragic consequences in a very real way, such as this case. Uh, Koket, as your final point? Yeah, that's really what I, wanted, what I wanted to bring up in that the police are nowhere to be seen here. And it's not the police who actually did the job of recovering the children at the end of the day. Mm. Good news for the parents. But in the grand scheme of things, police were nowhere to be found, really mm. underperforming in this aspect. And unfortunately, not everyone can, uh, not everyone is a public figure that the whole nation can go on a, a child hunt on your behalf either. And that's the thing, and uh, Martin, I must come to you because it, it's critically important because it exposes the, the broader nature of this problem. The Morty boys were not and are not the only children and really people who face this type of crime, which has risen, by the way. Um, so clearly there are criminal syndicates to recognize there is a failure of law enforcement and this therefore being an opportunity for them to make that quick buck if it is a quick one. Yeah, no, look, I was very surprised when I read the first uh, news story that the, the brothers have been found. I, I, I am very used to reading stories about the uh, the corpses of missing children being found. And I, I, I was very, very pleasantly surprised by this. But of course, I wasn't surprised to learn that it wasn't some daring special task force raid that found them, but rather... Uh, neighbors, uh, them coming across uh, uh, neighbors, um, uh, ordinary South Africans having to call it into the police. And of course, I believe uh, the, um, the national police spokesperson said that uh, South Africans shouldn't, uh, just because in the public domain there isn't a lot of information, assume that uh, the SAPS wasn't on top of the situation. Uh, I, I'm, I feel comfortable assuming that, to be totally honest with you. I, I feel very comfortable assuming that. And I feel very certain assuming that the SAPS was not on top of the situation. Yeah. Uh, and and it, it, it really, at the end of the day, comes down to what I've, I've said a few times now, and that is that there is no such thing as a South African police service. Uh, mm. it, it, it basically doesn't exist. Uh, mm. We have, and uh, this was said at a, at a previous conference, and I, I think it was put so well um, that I attended this weekend, we have privatized the police. This is something that very few countries in the world, uh, libertarians are, are probably very jealous of South Africa because uh, police is the, the state monopoly all around the world, but we have privatized the police. There are more private security officers in this country than, than the police by, uh, by, by a large margin. Five uh, to one. Uh, Yes, five to one. Uh, it's probably larger than the military at, in, in some, some respects as well. Mm -hmm. uh, people, people with the means, as you, as, as you say, um, uh, uh, hire private investigators. Uh, uh, when you watch documentaries about uh, uh, certain high-profile murders, <coughs> there's always the, the PI there who, who is really leading the, leading the charge and being undermined at every, at every tur uh, turn by the police who want to protect their, their jurisdiction. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, in some way, I'm, 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 I'm very glad. We've privatized the police. The police are not, a, are not a, a, a significant threat to our civil liberties. But, of course, we do exclude the uh, 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 millions of poor South Africans who really don't have the means to, uh, to, to provide for their own private security. What they do have the means to provide for is for their own personal self-defense with firearms. Uh, uh, in, a, in a relatively unregulated firearm market, you can uh, uh, afford a firearm quite cheaply. And uh, this, this is where I will be the kooky libertarian on the panel and say that we need significant firearm deregulation and obviously to do away with, uh, uh, with this nonsense that Vicky Taylor is trying to do with the Firearms Control Amendment Act. Because yeah. if, the driver, if the driver of that vehicle, which was transporting the Monty brothers, was heavily armed, uh, this thing might have, might have gone differently. Uh, yeah. uh, of course, that, yeah. it holds its own risks, but it, 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 they might have never gone missing because the, 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 the kidnappers would have probably decided we're not going to take the risk because South Africans are armed or they would have been dead, which have been, which have been a, 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 a mercy in its own right. So that is, to, in my view, really the only good answer that the poor have. I don't think we're going to reform the SAPS. I don't think we're going to save it. Uh, but I do think we can enable the poor in, in many ways to protect oh. themselves um, and, and, and uh, bring about a bit, a bit of equality there with, with the wealthy who have their own private police forces patrolling in the oh. night.
And maybe, Peggy, let me come to you. I know this is not necessarily your, 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 your bread and butter, but there is an economic impact in this. I mean, for instance, the, the multi-family in this particular instance, um, very well-renowned, big business family out in Epulukwane. I'm right, Epulukwane. Um, but it, it, the story transcends them. It, it's a story of how you cannot, you simply cannot grow an economy if you do not have the rule of law and a law enforcement that is able to enforce laws um, uh, uh, and, and obviously maintain uh, law and order. Exactly, Sisha. Um, a prime example that comes to what you just said there, Sisha, is July. If you recall uh, watching the mm. media during the July riots, in certain instances, it was the media that was first before the actual police. And even when the police were there, they were incapable of actually mitigating the, uh, the situation that was occurring there. And unfortunately, the consequences of that is that a, a lot of businesses were burnt down and unfortunately, some of them closed down. In fact, in my area, certain shopping centers were burned down and some of them are unable to recover from that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the thing about it is that the difference was that with the shopping centers that are here and the ones that were in Alberton, this is Fairview and Alberton's neighboring uh, 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 area, is that the ones in Alberton had private security. And this is unfortunately why, unfortunately, small businesses as well as ordinary South Africans, poor South Africans don't have access to, and that is private security, which unfortunately mm -hmm. the police minister is trying to undermine was all uh, uh, making it so that only a majority of uh, a portion of the security fund is managed is owned by a South African, not that by foreigners. That carries huge risk. And in fact, instead of actually incentivizing more private sector into the South African economy, which would actually lead to increased investments if you're able to secure your investments, that's the thing. It's not about uh, uh, just simply investing. Do you have the certainty that your investment will carry out through the return that is required? by means of security and by means of policy, such as that of scrapping EWC, which unfortunately the, currently, the country does not seem to have. And in fact, we're constantly attacking, be it in terms of expropriation of property without compensation, or be it that of attacking the private sector, as well as that of the individual trying to take away a firearm uh, in use of some things. Absolutely, guys, unfortunately we are pressed for time. I must get to that last topic because really it dominated the Newsweek last week, and it's likely going to dominate it um, as we head closer to the funeral of the former late uh, president uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm right, president, the last apartheid president of South Africa, effectively, um, F.W. de Klerk, and of course, one of the first deputy presidents in the new government uh, of what was the government of national unity, if anybody can even remember back that far. But a chap who, uh, in his late 80s, has now succumbed to the cancer which he was grappling with. Sara, I must come to you because the story here isn't so much the passing of, of de Klerk. I mean, we all knew he was quite ill and, you know, he was a very seasoned old gentleman. Um, the real story is here is, is the response to the death of de Klerk. Um, Koketsu alluded to it earlier on, you know, uh, we're often lectured uh, ad nauseum by certain groupings in this country around, oh, when someone dies, you know, we don't speak ill of the death. And then this runs, or this notion, pardon me, cuts across all cultural groupings. Yet those individuals, if they had an ax to grind with the clerk, seemingly put that notion to the side. And we've seen some of the worst vitriol being directed at this man who has a family grieving at the moment. Mm. But it, it, it's not just that there's a, there's an, in, in that vitriol and that nastiness, there's a there's a lack of there's a lack of empathy that we are you know that they, we tend to have to show a lot is shown to um, say black liberation heroes, some of whom are very flawed um, mm -hmm. or became very flawed during uh, since the start of democracy, and. The, the very much the pattern, I think the, that happens with most people is the pattern is you minimize their bad points and you maximize their good, uh, whatever ratio, ir irrespective of the ratio. Now, whatever Declerc, you know, Declerc represent, certainly represented a, a heinous system, but the, the, the significance was that notwithstanding that system, he saw what needed to be done in the circumstances of the time, of the opportunity to be, to be taken to make 
a change. And mm. whatever they say about, you know, the, the, the ANC got, you know, only what, what the Nats uh, gave them, is, is, it's nonsense. Um, there's no doubt that ANC benefited hugely from that. And theoretically, the society should have as well. And, and the, the, the tragedy for the society is that he created an opportunity that none of those detractors, those, those, the, that vitriol, can take away from him. And that was the fact that he completely upturned our history. And yeah. it's moments like that, you know, it's, it's, it's usually the flawed guys who do see the light that make the differences. It's not, mm. it's not the good guys. The good guys just carry on being good guys. No one pays them much attention. But there's no doubt, when he announced the unbanning of the ANC and the freeing of, of Mandela from, from prison, I mean, that was, that was startling in any country's terms. And the, the lack of generosity, the desire to, um, you know, glad he's dead and, and uh, it's... it's there is an element in our society that is very unforgiving and very ungenerous when mm. it chooses to be. And I, I think I, I, it, maybe it's, it's sort of partly a, 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 what, a, what Gabriel said about Israel. They, they make the noise and they make the dreadful gestures because they know that what they're saying is not actually true. <clears throat> and this is the point I think I want to get to uh, as I go to Coqueto and then Gabriel. But guys, let's be brief, please. We're running out of time. Um, there is an amnesia that has taken over certain groupings in this country. And really, uh, it, the horseshoe theory comes together quite nicely here. When, insofar as on the one side, um, it's these, uh, I like to call them sort of the woke blabbity blacks, you know, those who have to prove that they are blacker than thou by being absolutely vile towards white people. And on the other side, it's that Fukramta, uh, as you say in Africa, it's a Fukramta type individual who never wanted freedom anyway, uh, so they say. And, and I'm seeing some of them in the comments who just refuse. And this is where they, they actually get together and, they, and their bosom buddies. They refuse to accept that the clan actually did the right thing. How we responded as a country post uh, his reform, so to speak. In other words, what we did with that opportunity he gave us is our fault as a nation. We can't blame him for screwing up what he, in essence, with Umandela and other um, individuals back in the time who were responding to the metrics of the time, by the way. What, what we chose to do as a nation to squander the opportunity their reform gave us is not De uh, fault. And if anything, he probably went to the grave as a, 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 a resolved man in that regard. Or am I reading too much into this, Coquette? No, you're absolutely not. So in, in high school, I, yeah, one of my high school subjects was history. I loved history, uh, I finished with a distinction even, uh, because I read and I'm not afraid to write either. But I distinctly remember sitting in high school history class having a lot of the same debates that happened this past week of whether Dittler did the right thing, whether it was of his own volition, whether the international pressure was too much, et cetera, et cetera. My response to this is very simple. Uh, Dietlerk was president for basically two minutes before he decided to unban the ANC and, uh, you know, and uh, announce in a sauna that he's going to release political prisoners. You know, I, yeah, I, I was just shy of being born when he did this. But, you know, that is the reality. You know, he completely did this, splitting his party in two, by the way. Uh, you know, some people angry, some people walking out. People forget that history. And it is something to be celebrated. And then on top of that, he then decides to stick around post-1994 so he can show the new government where the keys are, which locks, uh, which keys opens, which doors. What is an actual government? People forget. They think the ANC was this, you know, ready to govern party. No, it wasn't. You know, it was a liberation movement. They had no idea how to govern. You know, a lot of them didn't even know how tax law works, you know, for example. De Cleric and uh, some of his compatriots then stick around and decide, you know, let's not be yet another African country and let's actually help these guys, uh, you know, uh, run a government post elections. They stuck around and then they helped again with building a constitution. All things the liberation movement had no idea how to do because they are a liberation movement. They weren't even a political party up until they were unbanned. So he did a lot. For me, he did enough. 
You know, he didn't need to, you know, issue any further apologies later in life. For me, he had done enough, but maybe that's me being objective. So that history, these little facts, and these are not groundbreaking, groundbreaking facts here. Mm -hmm. you know, these are very little facts that add up. People don't see that they ridiculously ignorant of that and it's a shame and it just shows that perhaps uh, more people need to go back to high school and really have a closer look at that history just like i did more than 15 years ago absolutely martin i'm gonna come to you then gabriel sorry um and i'll tell you why you know for me it's not about celebrating um the clerk as the last party president no one no one's suggesting that here nor is anybody suggesting perhaps that you know of that which was bad that he did do, that he should never be accountable for or, or anything like that. No, that's not the point here. The point here is examining who we are. So we know who he was, but who are we as a nation in a moment like this? Are we the bitter, um, mendacious, spiteful, hate-filled people? Or do we say, you know what? Here's a man who lived his life, good, bad, and the ugly, Here's a man who chose to do something which ran against the stream, so to speak, back in his day. He had the bravery, if anything, in that regard, to do that, to take hands with someone like Umar Deba. And I should say, you know what? We can't fix uh, what we got wrong. We can't fix what we even effed up. Um, but it's up to you now, dear South African, to take the pattern forward. And a part of me feels as though the anger and the vitriol being directed at declared is actually perhaps an anger and a vitriol at ourselves and our failure given where mm. we are right now, where Ute Klai can have a final message to this nation where we realize, Yere Mensa, what this man is saying actually is what we were meant to be, but we're clearly not. Martin and then Gabriel? Yeah, directly relevant to the question of, of who are we as a society, I want to jump to this, uh, this I guess, Ford experiment. The year is 2025. President David Mabuza, in a surprise speech, announces that... Uh, 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 all labor regulations will be uh, uh, abolished. I'm assuming my sound is terrible, uh, but uh, uh, all, all labor relation, uh, uh, regulations will be abolished and the market will be freed. Uh, we now have a free society with a growing economy and uh, uh, a, liberal, a liberal constitution that is respected. Do we thank the reformer or do we uh, uh, hold his history against him? Uh, that, to me, is the fundamental question that uh, we need to ask. Do we incentivize reform? Uh, do we tell uh, uh, people part of problematic movements that uh, 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 if they reform, we will thank them for it or that we will continue shitting on their legacy? That is something mm -hmm. we can only decide as a, as a society. And I can hear through your sound that my sound is terrible, and I apologize for that. No, but no, it, let's, let's incentivize reform. Uh, oh, wait, no, but I, I'm, I'm hearing a uh, cracking. But anyway, let's incentivize reform. It does not matter how terrible someone's policy paradigm is if they decide, listen, okay, we're done with this now. We are going for uh, freedom, uh, even in a small measure. Thank the reformers. If it's President Becky Tele, if it's President Julius Malema, if it's President Idi Amin, if they reform, we have to incentivize that. We have to thank them for it. And I thank F.W. de Clark for for reforming uh, uh, and giving us what, compared to what came before, is a free society, uh, uh, which we really shouldn't look down our noses at. Absolutely. And it, it, absolutely. And it wasn't the sound. It was more just hearing the words President Mabuza, uh, <laughs> which just literally gave me a sinking feeling. Uh, Lord, take me now. <laughs> Actually, yeah, no, 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 no. Um, Gabriel, I'm going to end it off with you, um, and then we'll do final comments with everybody. But again, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, guys. You know, this man is gone, and there is a family out there which is grieving him. And what we're seeing play out in the corporate media, the commentariat, is a conversation about whether you should get a, a state funeral or not. Or, as we saw, the mendaciousness and the mean the vile, the wickedness on social media, a hashtag FW Declared Memorial Service, and all it was was filled with people literally berating this man and even flat out racism. I'm not even going to pretend. Flat out racism, which was obviously hidden behind the fig leaf of, oh, well, we're black and we were victims of apartheid, so we can actually speak like this about this nonsense. Identity politics has corrupted this nation, um, or at least the commentariat and the corporate media in this nation, Gabriel. 
Yeah, man. And I think I think if only if only we could draw a line between just ordinary South Africa and the and the and the people who run the 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 echo chambers of most TV and radio and Twitterati and so on. Um I'm gonna keep my comments very brief because I'd like to recommend something. So okay. my 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 sort of the man who taught me how to fish and bowl leg spin as a six year old, uh, and who was my writing mentor uh, in my twenties, Rian Milan, who especially some of the old viewers might remember, was the author of My Traitor's Heart. Um, he wrote a piece about F. W. De Klerk in 2010 for the Spectator, the sort of uh, grand, uh, sort of conservative, witty magazine of the United Kingdom. And it starts out something like this. Dear reader, I was in a bar, I was in a pub last week, and I nearly murdered an Englishman. He was saying nasty things about the clerk. And it was all the same things, like Ketzer was saying. None of this is new. Dude, the, the racists who hate him because he's white and don't want to look past that. And also the racists who hate him because South Africa now has a democracy in which you can vote no matter what your race. Those two, that shoehorn issue, that's that that was around before he was dead. Now he's dead. Those guys are singing their songs again. Sis, sis. Um, uh, Rian ends his piece by saying, uh, you know, and I'll moor anyone who doesn't say cheers to F.W. de Klerk. And I think it's I think it's an outrageous line, but it's a funny line. And it's a good line. I think he makes a very good case. Uh, so the thing that I want to pitch here is Two Crickets and a Thorn Tree. Uh, that's Ooh. the podcast. It's not on YouTube. It is on all podcasting platforms. Iono, Apple Podcasts, all that kind of stuff. And you can find it on the Daily Friend Show because we don't have, you can't see us, uh, but you can listen to us. And we shot, we just before this shot a conversation for an hour and a half with Rian just about this issue. And nice. Rian was uh, a very important journalist at the time, uh, covered, I think, one of the watershed moments at Boy Patong, uh, which really changed the trajectory of. Uh, de Klerk's transition and it was it was a fascinating conversation I'll just finish it by saying this if there's no state funeral I think that's that's uh, disappointing I think the pomp and ceremony of, of state business is important of course South Africa's state funeral for Nelson Mandela was the single most embarrassing thing in the 21st century uh, so you know maybe it's a mercy if there isn't Another flipping humiliation like that. And by the way, no. uh, Maponya, Richard Maponya's funeral was was uh, no short second place for just for sickeningly disgusting disrespect uh, of of a good dead man by inept useless people. Um, Absolutely. Uh, that withstand that understanding. If there's going to be no state funeral, you know, raise your glass and toast a man who changed. Mm. Mm. Change building mm. on your change is important, and, and I, I must leave it there. And I think that is really the comment here. You know, the ability to see when you are wrong about something and change your mind. Something we're not seeing anymore, and I can understand therefore why those individuals would take exception to a character like U U Declerc. So on this show, we say rest in peace uh, to U Declerc, and really condolences to his family. Who, whatever you think of the man you know, has loved ones right now who are actually grieving his death. With that being said, and having said that, let me do last comments, please, Peggy. I'm going to begin with you. Um, how do the folks find you if you want to be found on social media? And how do we get in touch with the CRA and its content? Yeah, so how I can be found is uh, through CRA work, which you can check out at cra-sa.com. Or you could check out the CRA YouTube where we do short 10 minutes analysis of what's happening in the country. My closing comment is Gabriel has mentioned as well as what Martin has mentioned in regards to comment, and that is that of change. Um, the, the elections about two weeks uh, ago, I never would, would imagine that the ANC would dip below 50% ever. And if they aren't willing to increase the living standards of South Africans that um, uh, would lead to higher employment levels uh, uh, as well as income levels for them to support, to support themselves and their families, then I do see a possible defeat of the ANC in the 2024 national elections. Mm -hmm. So 
that's my closing comment is that the consequence of having hostile policies, the consequence of the ANC not changing its trajectory, it's its own defeat. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, Sara Gunn, of course, mm -hmm. uh, how do we find you and the Daily Friend? Well, on dailyfriend.co.za, which you can find all our articles, um, our daily podcasts on what's happening from, from one day to the next, and uh, Gabriel's uh, Two Crickets in a Thorn Tree. And uh, it's, I highly recommend the, uh, the, the, honest, the honest opinions that appear therein. And uh, my colleague, and uh, I think that's the, that's that's the best place. Absolutely, absolutely, Martin. Of course, um, I know you do quite a lot of writing and the like. But how do we find you, homie? Yeah, so my uh, main port of call is martinfunstarten.com. You'll find all of my writing across all of my platforms there. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. That's uh, at martin underscore ASFL. You can find me on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash liberty, one word. Uh, and you'll find that I'm very active on those platforms. And of course, last message from me, please, 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 no defeatism, people. We need all hands on deck. Please do the, the bare minimum that you think you can. Give give a few rand, give a like, mm -hmm. give a share for, for all platforms. Don't 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 think that it's hopeless. It's never hopeless anywhere. Just just keep doing what you're doing by watching this uh, this this platform and other other platforms and we will prevail, of course. Absolutely, absolutely. Gabriel, um, very, very briefly, how did the folks find you? Um, I actually did mention it early on. Yeah, but, I already um, mentioned that. So let me say, look, here's what I want you to find. I want to find, I want you to find the IROC campaign to cancel the command council, to disband yeah, but, the command council, to end the lockdown, to end the curfew, to end this rubbish. We're building our, we're building our, 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 our legal case. We're building the public pressure. Like I said, already over 10,000 petitions. Go to ir.org.za. You'll find that campaign first thing there. Disband the command council. You'll also see it if you go to the Daily Friend. Please, this, the, the, this message from Becky, uh, Sarah, Martin. Uh, let me put a cynical Russian way of describing this. I love Russia. They're very cold. There's a Russian phrase. When hope is gone, then everything is gone. So if there's anything left, that means hope is left. And that's something to build on. And especially in this situation. You know, last time we, we had a big campaign about uh, the command council, we said save the vote, stop this postponement, yes. and we won. So we know how to win. And uh, the vote was very telling. And if we can keep winning in the build-up to 2024, <clears throat> think about it. Just think about it. And then absolutely. do something. Absolutely. 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 Okay, so... Final word is yours. How do the folks find you? And what can we look forward to on Man Patria? So uh, it turns out I'm one of the more conservative, outspoken, black conservative guys on Twitter. So find me there. Uh, yeah, my mentions are blowing up now because of Nom Boni Sogasa, who I think is a lecturer at UCT, but that's oh, another no. story. So. Yeah, uh, she's on my list now, along with Eusebius and, 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 and Mighty Jamie and a few others. Oh, anyway. the race grift is. The race yeah. grift is. Yeah, she's on oh, my man. list. So, yeah, find me there. Uh, pretty active on there. Uh, yeah, Man Patreon, we're still going strong. Uh, podcast just premiered as also. As soon as you're done watching that, go over and uh, listen to that. Or even as you're working tomorrow, mm -hmm. give that a listen as well. And uh, yeah, now that my year's starting to slow down finally, uh, yeah, um, I'll tell you where to find my writing. <laughs> Well, on that glorious note, a big thank you to all my panelists this evening. That was Gabriel, Uko Keto, Peggy, Martin, and of course, Usara. There she is uh, as I get her off screen. Folks, thank you for watching this episode of Liberty and Friends. Apologies once again for it being a day late. Uh, we will try and keep to Sunday, although with me being on the road as much as I am, <laughs> it's debatable. So please uh, indulge me when I do postpone the show. I hope you enjoyed the show. Let me know what you think. This show is all about you and it is interactive. So please drop those comments. I do sometimes sit with a cup of coffee or tea. Actually, I lied. I don't do coffee. Uh, tea <laughs> and, uh, sit and sit and read your comments. Folks, thank you so much once again for watching. A reminder, the Big Daddy Liberty Show, Wednesday 
at 7 p.m. Very interesting episode as we look at the world of cryptocurrencies, decentralized finance, and more importantly, non-fungible tokens or NFTs. There's some very interesting young men who have launched something that is very South African that hopefully, hey, maybe can get you interested in that side of things. So look forward to that on Wednesday at 7 p.m. only on the Big Daddy Liberty Show. With that being said, a reminder, at the end of every show, as I always say, never trust a comedy. <laughs>